When people hear that I speak Yiddish, that I'm a Yiddishist, their first question is often, oh, did you grow up speaking Yiddish? And sadly, I have to answer, no, I'm an accidental Yiddishist. But I did grow up speaking Spanish. In fact, my lifelong fascination with Hispanic cultures finally led my husband and me to Cuba this past July. We went on the general license for scholars and researchers, and I was going in order to investigate Havana as a Yiddish cultural center. Ironically, it was only after a 14 and a half hour bus ride out of Havana to the second city of Cuba, Santiago de Cuba, that I gained a crucial insight into how Yiddish has centered me. But before I began teaching, I asked those who had gathered to share with us something of their own experience. And they related a story to me. By 1961, 90% of Cuba's Jews had fled the island after the revolution. The minion dwindled. Ultimately, there was no minion. Things were looking very grim by the late 70s. The synagogue was no longer able to pay taxes on the building that the government required. It was time to shut down. There was one last bar mitzvah in 1979, and then they packed up the Torah scrolls lovingly and sent them away to Havana for safekeeping. The building was nationalized. The government divided it in two, gave half of it over to a private individual as an apartment, and gave the other half over to a dance troupe as a rehearsal space for Carnaval. But in 1992, the Cuban constitution was amended so that no longer a, an atheist country officially, Cuba became a secular country. What that meant was that it was once again legal to be Jewish. This led to a renaissance of Jewish life across the island. The community in Santiago had been so isolated that there were times throughout the 80s when people didn't observe Yom Kippur because they didn't know which day it was. Now, in the mid-90s, they were going to get their building back. They were going to be able to rededicate it as a synagogue. So it was a very exciting time. The Torah scrolls were on their way back from Havana. Things were looking up, but there was one problem. There was no ark in which to put the Torah scrolls. The eastern wall of the synagogue had been plastered over with drywall, and nobody could remember the dimensions that these two Torah scrolls would require. They tried contacting Havana, but communication was very difficult. The isolation was really quite unimaginable to those of us from outside of Cuba. And the deadline was approaching. So finally, the synagogue president, who was also an engineer, made the call that they were going to have to break through the drywall and see if there was some indication of what the dimensions had been of the original ark. When they broke through that drywall, they discovered that the ark was completely intact, covered over, waiting to be discovered. This story was related to us because this became the guiding image for that community's understanding of itself. And I'm relating it to you now because that image of the arca destapado, the uncovered ark or the discovered ark, that has become my image and my understanding of what Yiddish has done for me. If the Yiddish language has returned me to myself, I would like to propose that Yiddish literature, even Yiddish literature in translation, might well be the arca tapado, the covered ark, that awaits discovery by the American Jewish community. Yiddish literature offers us a unique link in a chain to a millennium of Jewish flourishing in Europe. I'd like you to take a look at this bookshelf that 100 years ago might have been perfectly normal, but is rare today. We see here the Talmud, a tikkun for practicing Torah reading, a sidur, a chumash, and a complete set of Sholem Aleichem. Now, that's my bookshelf. It's rumored that the Inuit of the Arctic Circle have many words for snow, so it only makes sense that the people of the book should have at least two terms for the book. Indeed, we have the Hebrew-derived sefer, plural in Yiddish is sforim. That refers to our sacred literature. And we also have the term buch, 
the plural being Bicher, that derives from the German, and that has to cover just about everything else. Now, Bicher are vulnerable in a way that Sforim are not. Bicher, Yiddish literature, is the product of a rapidly secularizing world, and it's not part of our canon of religious texts. That means that Bicher, as American Jews have assimilated and acculturated and lost their connection for the most part with the Yiddish language, that means that Bicher have become something of an endangered species. But it's precisely the same reason for that endangerment that brings about an urgent need to be able to access the contents of these books. So Yiddish literature develops over 200 years, which is a brief span in the epic sweep of Jewish time. But it's a critical span for us, because that's the era. That is the thought that leads directly into our own time. Yiddish literature grows out of the Haskalah, out of the Jewish Enlightenment. And the Haskalah is all about making the Jews normal, making the Jews like everybody else. And so much of Yiddish literature aims to be universally human. But these Yiddish authors can't help seeing the world through distinctively Jewish eyes. We're going to take a peek today through the iconic spectacles of Eliezer Steinberg, who lived from 1880 to 1923 and published, mostly after his death, 150 fables in verse that he had written. We're going to take a look at Steinberg's first fable, which is called Sveiroisen, Two Roses. Now, like about a third of his poems, this one is borrowed from another fabulist, from the great Russian fabulist Ivan Krylov. And Krylov's fable, like the one that Steinberg is going to write, is about a conversation between a natural rose and an artificial rose. Now, the artificial rose is very snooty. She's very high on herself. She's very catty. She really feels clearly that she's better. She's a perfect form. And she lords it over the natural rose. Now, in Krylov's telling of the fable, the Russian version, this conversation takes place outside in the garden. So when it rains, the artificial rose, who is so high on herself, is destroyed. And the natural rose, of course, flourishes. Steinberg writes a more tragic, less pat ending to the fable. His fable concludes with the natural rose delivering herself of a soliloquy that defends the end of her life, which is surely impending, against the absence of life. Let's take a look. Eder ebek trucken, und nicht wissen keinmal nicht von Toi und nicht von heiße Blicken, starben und hat sie einmal mit der Truppen Toi sich quicken. She says, then be always dry and never taste the dew or warmth of sun, I'd rather die and just one time at least renew, delight myself with a drop of dew. Now, this term at the end of the fable, kvikensich, meaning to delight, this is an essential word in Steinberg's lexicon. He felt that the response to the evils of the world was to delight. It was both an ethical and an aesthetic imperative to kvikensich. His Jewish twist on this fable, the place where he sets it apart from Krilov's fable, is to set the poem indoors and to make the natural rose, a Jewish rose, who laments the fragility of, East, of Jewish life in Eastern Europe. She knows that her days might be numbered, and nonetheless, she says, you know, I wouldn't want to be tough like you. I would rather live in the way that I have. Her response to everything is kvikensich, to take pleasure, to delight, to engage. She embodies a special kind of Jewish defiance of history, a special brand of chutzpah. So what, in addition to these two roses, can Yiddish literature offer you? How about a cycle of stories about a father whose many daughters, who none of his many daughters, can pick the right man to marry? A parent's poetic lament about a workday so long that the father only sees his toddler when that precious child is sleeping. 
a woman's guttural cry of anguish and frustration at the narrow sphere to which her powers are confined. An episode of messianic hysteria set during the 19th century that stands in for a political hysteria of the 20th century. All of this and more awaits you when you do the two things that I'm going to ask of you today. First, I want you to read something from the canon of Yiddish literature, whether it's one of the classics, pick up Sholem Aleichem, or Mendele the Book Peddler, or Yod Lamed Peretz, YL Peretz. These books are available now in wonderful translations. Read them in whatever language is most comfortable for you. Or pick up the work of a modernist, Yisrael Rabon, David Bergelson, or a poet like Gladstein, Halper, and Leib, Levik, Molodovsky, or even an anti-modernist and a Nobel laureate like Isaac Besheva Singer, or his sister, the novelist Esther Kreitman. And then, when you read these books, I want you to ask, what does this have to do with my Jewish life? And if you find something that you can cherish Jewishly in these books, then I'd like you to do what I've done, which is to move these bicher to the shelf with the sforim, to create a place in your Jewish heart for some of these modern Jewish literary texts. Our closeness to Yiddish over the grand sweep of Jewish time gives us a special responsibility as stewards of this literature. In 200 years or in 500 years, Jews looking at our time will know that the big story of our centuries was secularization. And they will wonder, how did we grapple with those challenges? What wisdom did we bring to bear on this rapidly changing Jewish reality? And how sad it will be if we have to tell our great-great-grandchildren that we plastered over our ark through benign neglect, through distraction, through apathy. Now, I've made it sound as if reading Yiddish literature is like eating your vegetables. And it's true that these texts offer something of a moral fiber supplement, but Yiddish literature will also delight you if you let it. Sholem Aleichem famously said, Lachen is gesund, doktorim hasten lachen. Laughter is healthy, doctors prescribe laughter. I hope that you'll read these books and laugh, and that you might find in Yiddish Bicher an ark to contain the experiences most sacred to you in your own encounter with Jewish modernity. Thank you. Thank you.